myself as well. Um, <laughs> this is, have you done stuff like this before? Have you done any sort of like, uh, sort of production-y? Well, well you said, yeah, but then uh, COVID. <laughs> oh, of course. COVID. Of course, you would have had everything going on in COVID. Yeah, that's why I said, like, um, I need it early morning. Otherwise, the lines here, they're really bad. You don't have, like, Elon Musk, Starlink, fueling (laughs) the internet on on the northern slopes of Etna? (laughs) Probably Etna's the issue. (laughs) Doesn't get here. This is very, very true. I have been up to to around Solikiata uh, and loved your wines. Try them at Carvox, uh, some of the most ethereal experiences, so... Mate, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Thanks to you. How, you must be done harvest. You must maybe a yeah. couple of weeks ago? We finished harvest on, uh, around the 15th, 15th or 17th of, of October. And yeah, it was, it was very, very early. Again, you know, like in the last few years, every year was like, you know, this is the earliest one. <laughs> you go to the next harvest and that, that, that was the earliest one. And now this one also. But you know, for different issues, so um, people have a tendency to uh, to standardize uh, climate issues. I think and, uh, we've got an, uh, a complex situation where I think basically everything fitted, and so the vines they they really rush through the unnatural uh, maturation. I'm not saying this is a great vintage, but still uh, there's acidity. We've got enough uh, um, juice in the wines. I'm not saying the uh, perfect uh, phenolic ripeness, uh, but uh, I think it's it's more balanced compared to 2022, for example. So yeah, mm. all things considered, not bad. I imagine by now everything's through Malo, or do you push them through Malo? You just let yeah. them go? No, we let them go. Um, we pick relatively late here and um so we're mid-october as i said which is quite late for uh, for a standard in the, in the wine industry uh which means that the grapes they um they go into um, uh, i call this autumn uh, picking not summer picking and so when you go into autumn picking the uh, the, the breakdowns the acids uh, the uh, everything fits more into place and so we never had an issue with uh, with mallows not uh, not done or not completed. And uh, when we pick, uh, when the, the, the alcoholic fermentations are finished, then half of the mallow is already done. And so the uh, initiation is done, which is good to uh, to go through the uh, through the winter, and then around March everything is finished. It must be pretty like for us, you know, getting everything into the winery, getting everything in oak or getting everything sort of through Malo is just, yeah. that's when we can start to breathe for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, if you've got an early, early season, how are you feeling at the moment? You're feeling pretty chill? Um, yeah, you know, you know what, what is the issue? And uh, we, we also have the, uh, the olive uh, cultures and the uh, olive pressing. So the picking and the pressing of olives is usually is a bit strenuous because you have to work around in a um, rain, like uh, I just got up uh, like an, um, an hour ago and it was already raining again. And so you can't pick because the trees, there um, um, they are wet and you can't climb into a tree when you go shake the, the olives out, <laughs> you, you, you take a shower every time. So it, it's, an, uh, it, it's kind of quirky. Uh, so it takes a long time. You go step by step, and um, uh, it doesn't move and uh, move as fast and um, uh, like uh, like the picking of uh, of grapes. So it's a, diff- a different process. This year, I stopped after one day with the uh, with the picking of the olives because the quality was was not good. We had a, um, a lot of and, uh, the fruit flies. And they, mm-hmm. they 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 damage the olives, and uh, and so in general. The quality is absolutely not uh, not of a good, and uh, it's not good, you know. So after one day, it just stopped, and that's it. Does that affect? Because I imagine, are you picking for oil or picking for sort of fruit production? Yeah, for oil. Olives. No, no, for oil. oil. And we have we have fruit, but it's more for home and for friends. How would how would fruit fly affect olives for oil production? Well, it, it's called La Mosca Oliare, and, uh, which is basically, it's a fruit fly, and, uh, but it stings through the, uh, the, the outside uh, part of the olives. Uh, for, uh, we call it fruit because, you know, it, it's, it's part of what, uh, what the olives produce. It's not sweet. It's very bitter when you eat them. But uh, they damage the skin. And so through that small hole, it gets punctured. The, uh, the, the, the inside uh, flesh is oxidized. And so it basically rots. So it's an it's an unfortunate um, thing because you know you and um, 
well, I like all of it personally, but you know, when it's not good, it's not good. Period. That's it. And so we left the rest on the on the trees, and that's it. Oh no! So it sounds a little it's, bit like it's good. Well, it's, in grapes. Well, yeah, it's good for the birds. So they they also have something to eat. <laughs> well, you know, one compensates the others. <laughs> See, this is funny. My research uh, over the course of the last sort of couple of weeks, and I've already, I've, I knew quite a fair bit about your story because, well, you know, there's been a lot that's been written about you, Frank. Um, <laughs> Too much, and I'm always accurate. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I loved the fact that you, it's not just grapes, that you've got, uh, you go through three separate sort of harvests or periods from, from cereal grains uh, through to uh, grapes, through to, to olives. Um, is this part of, finding sort of balance in soil management mm -hmm. or how does how how did you land on no. doing three crops <clears throat> aren't you tired enough you're working quite a large amount of hectares these days yeah well we've got also quite a quite a good crew <laughs> we're um, 25 plus people so in um, on the land we're, uh, we're 20 plus and um, 21 22 and then in the cellar we've got um, uh, two to three people this Giacomo in them um, uh, for the visits we and um, uh, we've got Nico in the cellar, without counting uh, me and my wife. My wife pays all the crazy things that I buy, uh, <laughs> which is also kind of a balance. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's become a team, but you know, not really planned. So you know, we can handle quite um, quite a lot of things, um, but obviously there is a limit, and uh, and also the limit is is the the quality work you want to do. So if you want to rush through things, and, um, uh, you, you make an eyes, you, and, uh, you go very fast and don't really pay much attention to quality, then I could do maybe double or three times as, uh, as much. You know, you know, in the cellar, we're, um, we're pretty um, well geared up. Um, so it's much more of a, 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 um, an issue of getting organized for the picking. But, you know, that's not the thing we, uh, we want to do. So, yeah, we're, we're good with, with, with what we do today. And, uh, and it doesn't really seem that crazy and, um, after all. Because with all the people we have on the payroll, I, I think, you know, another estate would say, like, shit, you know, you should do double the amount of, uh, of bottles than you know, what, you, um, what you're doing. So, you know, it, it, it balances things out. So we're, I think we're good. We, uh, we found a, a balance point, although it might seem... Um, Seem, it might seem the opposite for people like you and um, uh, who look from the let's say outside of the aquarium where we're inside and um, uh, but for, yeah, for, for us who are um, uh, swimming inside the aquarium it's it's okay you know it's an, uh, I think it's a good balance no, nothing crazy are you surprised because when you started 2001 or just before with half a hectare, you're sitting on, I believe it's 24 <laughs> hectares at the moment. Are you, are you yeah. surprised? Did you, was this, was this planned? Or no. was it like, a, I hope it would go well, and if it does, we'll see where it goes. Well, basically that's, that's exactly what it was. Uh, you know, I, I didn't start um, uh, with a winery. Uh, I, I started making wine um, as, a, as a wine passionate person, uh, which is a very different um, um, starting point. You know, you, um, uh, you start a winery and then you know also the mechanisms. And uh, when you start a winery, the first thing you do is, is, um, uh, is look at investments, balance sheets, return on capital and whatever, whatever else. You know, it's not that I was completely um, detached from, uh, from economic and financial situations. I, I, um, I used to have my businesses and um, uh, a few went okay and a few didn't go okay. When, uh, so, um, um, you know, learning things the hard way, that's, that's what, what basically has, um, um, has gone through, um, um, through my life. Um, uh, uh, and so the, the wine thing was something very pleasurable because, you know, there's no stress and um, you, you work in, uh, tranquilly. And um, I had an, um, another job in, um, in 2001, the, the first uh, harvest. 2002 also so basically you can lose you can afford to lose a lot of things but then when things get serious you know the um, uh, the um, times get rough uh, you, you fall uh, you have to get up and then you learn fast um, not because you start making compromises but you learn how to manage um, what you've worked for a whole year uh, and that's why I'm saying I I usually see my, uh, um, I would say, my evolution through, uh, through time until, let's say, in, in a quarter of, uh, of a century, like what we're, we're at now, in, in basically three periods. Like I call it, the first one is gardening. 
why is that very intellectual? They, they, they come from a, from a theoretical intellectual concept, which is necessary. Without that, you can't even go into the next step. So you have to go through that. And that's taken, I think, two or three years. And uh, once I started in the farming full-time and making wines full-time, you have to live of what you produce. Then, you know, you put the pressure on the lid. And so 2006, and uh, I've gone through a crisis and I um, uh, just wanted to, to stop with the whole thing because, you know, it was, it was not viable. And we were doing about six or 7,000 bottles. So, you know, not bad, but um, um, uh, all the ends together, you know, my sister, she was also uh, worrying her brother, or my brother-in-law, uh, her husband, um, uh, who's in, um, in financing, and said, like, he had, for me, these, these <laughs> weird concepts. It's like he was totally theoretically saying, like, well, you have to do uh, 250,000 euros of turnover, otherwise, you know, you can't um, uh, live from that. So uh, one day you're going to have a family and this and that. And, and so it, that was really interesting. And so a few of these things, you know, they on the day, they kept hanging around in the, in my head. And so 2006, and we've gone through and, um, the, and a really bad period, wanted to sell everything. And so after the end of the, the summer, 2006, we lost, uh, figure it out, and, uh, more than 50% because of a, a heat wave. And, uh, so heat waves, you know, they're, they're not isolated for the times we live in now. <laughs> 2006, we already had one. And so I lost half of production. And so, shit, you know, what, you know, what do you do then? And uh, that, that's, that's a big issue. And, uh, you know, instead of continuing with, with what I did, you know, I, I just or stopping, and um, uh, I just said, uh, like, okay, I just, um, I'm going to look for, uh, for a few more hectares. Just the, 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 the complete opposite of what, yeah, I would say a normal person would have done with stopping um, uh, with this, uh, selling it, and uh, you just move to another job and uh, move on with your life and family and go and look for, uh, for securities. Just the, the other way around. Because, you know, I just wanted to make wine and I wanted to do this. And then you you learn, and so that was and, uh, that was a difficult one. That was very close to uh, to quitting, and uh, and so uh, I did, and uh, I doubled in, um, the, uh, the the actually I nearly doubled the quantity of, um, of of land and vineyards we have at that time, and at least another one, uh, a few of them. So yeah, that's today we're here. <laughs> that's fascinating for me because. One thing that stuck stuck out in my research, and forgive me, I'm going to embarrass you for a second here, Frank, but you, you're you're aging really well. <laughs> I, 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 I had no that's because idea. of the wine. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely something in the air. Um, uh, Not the coffee the, I'm drinking now. <laughs> you you were born in '61, mate. That means that mm. you moved. You made you you had a whole career, a whole life. You know, from Hasselt in uh, Belgium across. You're 40 uh, before mm. you start yeah. at Edna. You're yeah. 45, and you have this inflection moment where you're going to go. Well, do I give up or do I go hard? What people, mate? People who are 45, you know, they're, they've they've <laughs> they're not their 20s anymore. They're not doing things <laughs> sort of so so erratic that way. What? <laughs> What fuels you to to challenge the the mode? Because what re- I find you particularly remarkable because of your logic. You have this rigor and logic, it seems, in the way that you think and describe wine. It 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 mind boggles a little bit. You're 45 and go mm-hmm. stuff. It, I'm going to go double. Uh, why? What's the logic behind that? Uh, well, basically. I like what I do. I don't really think about the uh, the end goal. And for example, and I never made a, um, uh, and I rarely do um, uh, things for money unless I have to for for some details. But I, I never started a, a business, neither an an activity um, um, for the money. Uh, that's one thing. So basically, I'm uh, I'm I'm always passionate in in, in what I do and uh, and how I do this. And so. Uh, the economic side is it has to be viable, livable, but uh, you have to get to where you want. And so even today, you know, uh, we've sometimes have serious fights with my wife because of the investment. And so they've gone bunkers, the, the, the investments. If you look at it from a, from a, from a logical point of view, um, uh, as I am logical and, uh, but only 50%. I am a, a bit of a split personality. I'm 50% intuition and 50% logical. 
And so one keeps the other in, in balance. Although it sounds extreme, but that's basically where I'm, I'm, uh, how my, uh, my brain and how I work and how sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> and then you, you hit into trouble. <laughs> So the, you know, the, the thing is, I do things for passion because I like it. And so the first thing, when I, when I make wine, I, I, all the reference points are the, are the things I like to drink. And so if that doesn't fit there anymore, I change. And, you know, very honestly, I don't care what people say, what people think. And uh, I, I absolutely don't because the D reference point in what I do is me. Obviously, touching it to uh, to other people, I'm, I'm very sensitive to and um, uh, to reactions to how people think, how they taste, and everything else. I think the detail makes a difference, especially in I would say high precision uh, production of whatever you know, in, in uh, technology and um, uh, wine, food, and uh, that's why I love also the classic restaurants because. The high precision, the touch and detail, how you put a plate on um, um, on a table um, uh, for for um, for a client, how you position it, if there is a, um, a logo of um, of the restaurant or whatever else, you know, you put it in the right place. If it's off on them um, and it's in a different place on on uh, on every person, I just already get annoyed because I'm also very ordered, and uh, which means it goes nearly. It's very close to. Uh, I don't know how to say that. So OCD. Uh, have, you, have, you, have you ever seen that uh, that uh, <laughs> the, the the series um, Monk, um, this detective? <laughs> I'm not saying I'm definitely not not at that side, but I do get pretty crazy when things are not aligned and and uh, lined up and and put in a in a logical, ordered way. Mm. So I like that because it also saves you time, and that's again you know the. It, it's a, it's an aesthetic thing, but it's, it's also an, uh, when you come into a, a winery and everything is like put left and right without any logic, it makes you feel nervous. You know, I like when I get, I get into my winery, I just open the doors and everything is aligned. Boom. Just like it, it gives you um, a peace of mind. You know, it's, it's a mindset. The, th the same thing with the labels. People say, well, who's your designer? Well, that's me. And I'm a, I have a graphics guy, obviously, otherwise I can't do everything. And I say what to do. And, um, uh, and so after 20 or, or more years, we, we, um, uh, we are in tune with, uh, with, uh, with things I do, but it's, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a, yeah, it, it's a process of many different things. That's why I'm, I, uh, I, I, many times I explain to people, you know, the wine industry, it's, it's fascinating. Because at least in the old and um, uh, the old school and the old world, and, uh, you know, it's not about processing; it's about cultivating your raw material. You have to transform it, you have to promote it, you have to sell it, and and then you have to um, cure and uh, and like kids, your the young vines you planted, and you have to take care of them and then, um, for them not to die, and so. I think if you look at the whole process, which is basically an A to Z um, um, operation, it is absolutely crazy. You know, I, I still make all the invoices. I do this. I don't have an, uh, an accountant in house. And uh, I've got a guy who helps me with all the paperwork. And, uh, and my wife does, does all, the, um, um, all the payables um, and I do all the collectibles. And um, so it's really simple. And uh, I make the wine. I've got um, um, people in, um, uh, in, um, uh, out in the, in the vineyards. Uh, not easy um, because they're humans and uh, human beings. I think they're very complicated. I prefer animals or dogs or whatever else by far and um, much more easy to work with. Uh, and so, you know, it, it is, it's, it's like, and um, uh, you know, we have our family and uh, Nemo and I the two kids, but we got another family, which is um, uh, all the, uh, all the workers. And also they have problems, they have issues. And um, uh, so it, it's, it's really interesting to see that, it's not just about winemaking, it's about many other aspects, but many, I mean, really am amazing. And so uh, it is very uh, archaic as, um, um, as, a, as a profession. And it's something I like, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here, you know, when half an hour, an hour, we, um, we come talking, I um, um, uh, start making some invoices, prepare some, uh, some builds for the guys. We're restructuring an old um, building, like half an hour afterwards. And I'm going to have to explain, like, you know, the tiles, you, know, you have to glue on the walls, they have to be put there, and you have to start with that line. 
the monk thing um, um, and, uh, and not the other way around. Otherwise, you know, you have to rip the whole thing off and have to start all over again on Monday when you come back. So, you know, th there was <laughs> it, it, very fascinating. I love that, very honestly. My wife, it freaks her out that she also has to manage those stupid things on a house. Uh, so, you know, it depends on where you're where your attentions are as a person. And so uh, maybe I, I, I had a perfect uh, psychological profile for, um, for making wine, which requires some, I would say, sketchy, edgy um, uh, character on the map parts. So it kind of works. Okay, so originally from Belgium, <laughs> you're 40 years old, you come to Etna with this approach, this attitude, this rigor. Did you end up having any backlash from the locals? <laughs> it's not a real Italian thing. I mean. <laughs> no, no, but for, for various reasons, you know, um, it's true that I moved to Sicily, which is not really Italy because we are mm. completely in the South. And so it's a very Mediterranean culture. It would be the same than going to Greece. And um, they're very welcoming. Uh, and I would say maybe Sicily even more because there's an Arab influence. And so there is a cultural influence on this island, which is very embracing. Uh, it's in their culture. It's in their, their DNA and um, uh, in, in their genetics. And so it's, uh, it's been very, very nice to come here as a foreigner. Uh, I didn't know these things. I can talk um, um, about this afterwards, after having gone through to this period. There is a curiosity with um, uh, when you have an Arab influence, and I like who is this person? We don't know anything about it, and so people don't know how to react. They can't react negatively because your father um, um, stole something or killed somebody or whatever else. So you don't have any pedigree here, and so you start from zero, and you are who you are, and so uh, people. Uh, first observe, um, observe, and then you know they 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 very gently and, and very respectfully um, uh, approach you, and that is something I've, uh, I've I've profoundly liked. It's very different compared to a northern culture, which is quite blunt and sometimes obnoxious, because without asking anything, they've got already their foot in them uh, in your house, and you know that is something I don't like. I've never liked that, and um, uh, and so. Also here, you know, the strange thing is I, maybe I feel better um, as a person in a, in a Mediterranean culture compared to a northern culture. What I don't really like is that everything takes so much goddamn time here. Right? We're, we're restructuring the house, and, uh, which is an old winery from 1896. It's, it's beautiful. It's great. But everything takes, oh, just... A, a, a ridiculous amount of time. So, you know, you have this side where people are not really related to, to a clock. Like 4.30 here means it, 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 it moves between, um, not 4.25, but it moves between 4, let's say 4.30 possibly, but for the very few, and 4.45 or 4.50 rather. So, you know, everything opens up. And so at the beginning of the day, it kind of works. After four hours, you're late with everything. And then you have to just switch the whole goddamn program again. And so this kind of flexibility you need. And there is also on, uh, what weather phenomena does. Like today, it, 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 it should be dry. And it's bloody goddamn raining. And so in two hours, I have to call the guys like, listen, you know, change the program. And off we go again. So, you know, the, the whole day, you know, that continuously and constantly you change. So if you don't have that mindset and you have a very rigid mindset, you can't live here. Impossible. Just impossible. And so, you know, yeah, it, it can, I, I fit in this, in this schedule, basically. For some room of things like this, for other things like um, um, my, my audit approach, and, uh, and you, uh, let's say, a very logical and um, a programmed approach in, in a harvest is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, you can't make a great product. And that's the difference. You know, I come, uh, I have a, a, a northern ge genetic and, uh, material and, um, uh, and education, and I apply that with my personality and uh, who I am. I fit very well in, in a southern culture, and both things 
kind of, you know, um, combined, they kind of work well um, if you want to make wine. Because wine, you know, I usually call wine the, um, um, it's the, the Hollywood of agriculture. Um, because, you know, you, you, you make a very high-end, um, high-profile um, product from, from fruit, basically, which are grapes. But then you give that such a, a, a level of culture uh, because of the influence um, um, I had in my true Burgundy, but also in 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 in, in northern Rhone, for example, you and uh, you find throughout the, the whole of France and, um, the monks that, uh, that that dedicated their life on the study of maybe one small piece of land, and they can define the vintages, the difference with their the neighboring plot, and everything else. So, you know that kind of precision. I can't throw that away because that's part of who I am and, and my education and my culture. And I, I brought that to Etna. And, you know, I, I must say it kind of fitted because 25 laters on Etna, in, um, instead of talking about Etna as a, as a volcano spitting lava and destro the destroying things, people um, um, know that Etna produces um, uh, one of the greatest wines of Italy, if not from, um, uh, you know, of the whole world. And that's that is something gratifying. So yes, I uh, I like that. <clears throat> Are you because your wines have gone through, you know, as you sort of finally put it, sort of these sort of three stages, um, you yeah. know, of of I guess philosophy, sort of you've evolved and changed a bit, particularly from. And it surprised me when I started seeing your wines from 2019 onwards. Um, there's quite quite a distinct change there, as there was sort of midway through the 2010s, um, where we saw this sort of like just rapid, explosive growth, uh, and no one really knew that you'd already been doing it for 10 years, you know. At that point, you know, are you? Because I like the conversation around the brand, not the person, but so, more so the brand. Are you annoyed that people might pigeonhole you into something that simply doesn't exist anymore? No. Uh... Well, two things. Uh, uh, you're, you, you, you're using a word which is kind of amazing, like brand. I've always been so opposed against brands, although I've always liked it. For example, I, I, I love technology. I'm, I don't want to be a, become a, a victim of technology, but I, I always loved Macintosh. That's why I was struggling with the Chrome thing from Google. I'm still using the Safari. So. <laughs> um, but, but this... And, um, I... I I really love that, and maybe the the the, the, the brand of um, of Apple Mac, and uh, you know, I that's maybe the one thing that uh, they, that that brought me peace of mind because they made great, really beautiful products. And um, uh, but the brand for me, you know, I I didn't like that. If you look at the labels, for example, they are um, um, they are deliberately made without putting my name in big on the front label. I just didn't want that. It's like that, that obnoxious, big, like, boom, here I am. Like, that's me. I have a, an ego, and a, a, a big one, my wife says, but that's another issue. <laughs> but and, um, that is true, but I, I don't want to show it bluntly. You know, I, I have an, an idea. I have my, my strong, I would say, ideas about things, but... I think it's not very subtle to uh, to, to bluntly write that on a, on a label. And so brands, uh, brand building, I just didn't want to do it. And by not wanting to do it, it, it got actually stronger than I than I, I, I personally wanted that to. So that's the that's the crazy thing, you know, because you know you sell. With wine, you, you don't touch your, your, let's say, your village, and um, uh, not even your nation. It goes way beyond. Actually, by the way, Italy, you know, I started working well the last eight years. Um, from, uh, from when I started, you know, nobody was, told, nobody was interested in those crazy wines, you know. And it's not even because of the crazy wines like Sicily, Etna, who the hell cares, you know. It's like there's Barbarolo and um, uh, Brunello and Chianti and whatever else. But... You know, then um, uh, where I started um, uh, selling wines was in, in France, in New York. And um, then I met um, um, uh, Dan Clark contacted me and then in Australia. And uh, so, you know, everything got, and, uh, got, got rolling. And then Italy, you know, I, um, in Italy, I came through the back door <laughs> in Italy, basically. 
And now we can um, at least um, um, ring on, on the front door and, um, after eight years in Italy. And it, so, you know, this, the, the strength of something, of a name and what a name stands for, brand, and, uh, you know, is, uh, has become uh, exponentially important with a period like COVID. And, uh, COVID, for example, I think everybody was concerned, like, what the hell's going on here? They're closing down the world. And you can't even do anything. So I was terrified the, the, the first um, uh, two months, you know, calling all my importers, what's going on. What, um, uh, and so we didn't even know whether we could work in vineyards, whether the, um, uh, the warehouse um, uh, would be stopped for shipping. And so, you know, that, that, was an, um, uh, that was a crazy period where you, you, you start to understand that you are very fragile. And uh, because I have, I put all my energy in one um, activity. So the, 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 that brought me also thinking like maybe it would be better to have like different ones. But then after COVID, so like, well, shit, you know, we, we passed COVID, you know, um, something else will ex make the world, world explode. And so what the hell? But it, it makes you think about many things. And so back to brands and, and a name, it, it's unbelievably important and, um, to have a name because we sold so much wine during COVID. It just didn't stop, you know. I mean, containers and, um, uh, in the US and um, uh, in um, uh, all the monopoly systems where the, um, the, the shops who sell alcohol, they are government controlled. Just unbelievable, you know. The, um, uh, and, and that was a request from the consumers to the monopoly systems. And it, it worked, you know. It's just unbelievable how much we sold. It's crazy. And there you start to understand like, well, shit, you know, we, uh, we did build something and, um, with a value. People like a certain style of wine, a certain maybe area, what we do. And so it's nice because it gives you a good feeling. It's, it's, um, the, the products are, are appreciated. And so we did something right. And, uh, and then, you know, and, um, uh, today I look upon it as a different way. So it's fine. We have a brand. And so it, it, it gives you a, a more comfortable feeling. So you, you cannot neglect brand building and um, it, it's what you know is in people's mind and it is what what we stand for and, um, uh, and what we do so yes yeah, so be it so um, uh, from when i started completely uh, neglecting and actually being an anti-brand and i'm an ambassador and i'm uh, you know today it, it's fine it's what it is i concentrate on the product so that is very different i would say the first years were very anti, anti-brand, anti-sophistication of wines or whatever else. Then, you know, you have, I would say, uh, the, the fusion, the, the, the becoming of an, uh, a farmer. And once you become a farmer, you become more humble and uh, your own ego, you know, goes in um, uh, behind the the territory and then today mm -hmm. i think we uh, we've got a nice uh, balance with um, uh, with territory and i think the ones there they reflect that really well so it's a good evolution it's what i wanted and then um, yeah it, it's gone through through different phases and uh, evolution it's the it's, mm -hmm. it's the most appropriate word it's my personal evolution so yeah, I, I think it, I I feel good with it. It's um, it's really nice with all the uh, the, the ups and downs and uh, but in twenty five years there has been an evolution. And so if you do a vertical like like I did recently with the, uh, with old vintages like two thousand and four, I brought two thousand four ten. Uh, 12, 14, uh, 17, and, uh, 19, 20, and 21. And then you see like the last, um, the, the, the first years, there were big steps, big changes, because you, 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 you think of something, you, you notice something, you taste something, and you want to do this better. You buy things and uh, equipment, and then uh, you do longer aging, shorter age, you can, you can do many different things. And, and then you see this this evolution going and i'm sure it, it's very interesting for um, uh, for the public and for people who like our wines to follow that so when you do a, a vertical tasting of my wines you do a not a vertical tasting of the wines but you do a, 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 i would say a psych 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 uh, psychiatric um, um, evolution, evolution of, um, of me <laughs> here we go <laughs> 
But I suppose, like, in the early days, it makes total sense that you... you I, I'm trying to project <clears throat> and see if I was in your situation, putting the blinders onto brand, because you were doing some really edgy things for the rest of the wine industry to understand and comprehend and the wines were oh, looking yeah. edgy uh, as as a component of that uh and of course now you know your approach to things like sulfur is has altered uh and a lot oh, of people it's you know, know you know it's not just the sulfur thing sorry I'm, I'm interrupting here but you know many times people um, they, they focus on just that one single element but you know sulfur is such a tiny element and it doesn't really change that much either because you know yeast strains and uh, they they live even when um, when when a wine is i would say nuked and um, uh, with um, with an overdose of sulfur they're still alive not all of it but part of it so you know there there are much more influential aspects in winemaking where you know very few people talk about and uh, like for example um, uh, you could work organically and buying pre-packed, pre-prepped and, um, uh, yeast cells and uh, yeast strains um, uh, from a package. I think that is way more influential than, than, um, than a dose of sulfur. But, you know, the, the, the most important thing is uh, you start with the intellectual concept from day one or actually day minus one because you have to have the concept and then you start working through that and then you have your product. So from minus one, you go to one. Minus one, zero, one. And so that's, that's, the, that's the process. But that's totally theoretical, you know. And then after having made one, you notice that, oh, shit, you know, a few things don't really work. And then you start to want them to fine-tune. And you go through this whole phase of fine-tuning, uh, which, is, which is fascinating, very honestly. And so I am uh, thoroughly happy and, and um, uh, to to have a, a, quite a, an, uh, I would say a true and um, uh, an interesting and also intelligent following of people uh, who go through that phase. Because what I'm, uh, I've gone through, I think that um, uh, quite a lot of people would like to do that, but don't have maybe the possibility or the opportunity or they just don't just don't get there for a number of, um, um, of coincidences. And, you know, um, I've luckily uh, been in this choice of, um, of winemaking, maybe the right person at the right time in the, in the right place, which is rare. You know, that, that is very, very difficult to find that. Two out of three, you can hit and that's already something good. But if you hit three out of three, then obviously you have to make everything uh, um, uh, afterwards. You have to, have to have the mindset. You have to have the um, um, uh, um, uh, completely crazy and... Um, um, uh, psychiatric profile and whatever else so you have to have a split personality otherwise you can't talk with vines and you can't have make the word the wines you can't talk about culture either and so, so it, it's it's very complex and it that worked out so and it still works out even with the changes because i think fundamentally what i do is not something again you know it's not to make money um, we, we invest every um, every cent we, we make to to make things better also. So it, it's just to, to make things better um, um, for me. And then sometimes people say like, oh, shoot, you know, like these corks. Like in 2014, we start using those plastic bullets. <laughs> I call them bullets. And um, are they seal? And so people say, like, what the hell is this? Like, and I'm... Um, and then you explain things. It's very simple. You know, you avoid TCA, but not because of that. You know, you uh, you avoid the bottle differences because they age differently with natural corks and so. I said, so like, yeah, it makes total sense. So let's go for it. Fine, accept it. So yeah, there is there are so many things that other wineries really struggle with to change that we can do like in boom, just in one second. One go, next vintage, everything goes out in a different way. And you know, it's like, wow, man, he did it again. Like, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, to, but you have to have an idea. You, you have to have a logical explanation which makes perfect sense. And then you can talk about it. So like, uh, like for example, I, I don't like the evolution in natural wines with the, the, the mousiness. Like the mousiness... Is something that some people there's, there are some people that don't really detect it or, or very very difficulty. So you taste wine, it's like oh this is good, you know, 
yeah, but it, it's got a mouse in it. And so I, I, I can't really taste the fruit, neither what the varietal is, where the wine comes from. Uh, so, you know, I have a difficulty with that. So what to say, you know, some people say like, okay, we prefer to make um, uh, wines without sulfur regardless because um, uh, they prefer to do that. So I perfectly understand it. Some of them I, I still buy, but I don't want to make them because, you know, I don't like mousiness. And so if I have it in my wines, I freak out. I hate it. It's, it's such a disgusting taste for me. I just cannot stand it. And so that's why one of the big issues, and that was a buildup from already end of the end um, of 2000, and um, it was moving on gradually because tasting wines with friends and so on. And then you change. And so people say, whoa, he's using sulfur. Well, you know, if um, uh, 30 milligrams of sulfur um, um, helps me to avoid mousiness, well, so be it. I prefer it. And so what I like to drink is what I do. And so if you don't, then okay, I accept that. I understand it because I don't, you know, I'm not dogmatic. I'm not religious. And, um, uh, I am intuitive. And, um, I'm sensitive to, um, to, to many things. And, uh, but I'm definitely not a dogmatic person. The, the only thing that drives me is to make things better, not at all costs. That is important. There are, you, there are things I, you, I'll never do. Did your business suffer because of that? Actually, it went better. <laughs> you know, really, oh, wow. uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll explain you it, way better. And, um, uh, first of all, and, um, uh, I think people that, uh, that at a certain, you know, the wine world, in, um, uh, you can drink wine um, uh, like that because, you know, you need, you need a glass of wine for, for the fun, for the party, for, um, uh, for social drinking, call it like that. Wine still mostly is intellectual drinking. And so you open a bottle, you, you've waited for that for a long time. And so you, you cared for that, like, like children, like you, you, you take something precious out of your cellar and you open it and then it's fucked up and that's not nice. You know, um, um, so many times, you know, we, we had this with over oaked wines where you think like, oh, the oak will integrate like in the nineties when I was uh, buying for myself a lot of wine. And then you open it after 10 or 15 years and it's gotten worse, obviously, because the oak doesn't go on a holiday. It doesn't, it doesn't get out of the bottle and, and you know, the fruit does um, um, oxidize and it gets into a more balanced wine, but more fragile. And so the most harsh component, the most aggressive component just overrules all the rest. And so after aging, the other one is, is messed up with the, uh, with the oak. Um, uh, it's the same in the, in the vineyards. Now, if you leave um, uh, herbs and, and plants um, that are very, very aggressive, they overrule all the delicate ones and you have to manage that. Unfortunately, so, you know, winemaking like vine growing is something where man has to have an idea, a concept of beauty and balance. And that's the thing in wine. And so over oak is not good. Overly bacterial infections with mouse and everything else is not good either. And so usually the, you know, the balance is in the middle where, you know, you have a beautiful wine, you enjoy it with, uh, with people, with your friends, you have um, a, a, a nice food, which is being prepared. And, and so it's a great time. With wine, you, you should have, I think, a great time, basically. Or you do it very intellectually with friends, like uh, Saturday mornings and then, um, at 10 o'clock or 9.30, no coffee, and you get them, uh, get around the table with them. Um, but that's training, you know, that's just like mm. sports. You train mm. yourself to blind taste, and you do that on, um, uh, on tranquil moments, no work, uh, no hassle, no nothing, no stress. And then you go and have lunch, take the bottles, or if somebody cooks, or you go to a restaurant and, um, and have, um, uh, have lunch there. That's, that's what I used to do. So every, um, uh, every Saturday, it was training time. <laughs> Not to go play football, no. <laughs> to, to, pop, to pop corks, you know, to taste. In so, your, you know... In your journey, though, so, with um, moving towards or dealing with wines with no or low sulfur. I was fascinated to, to watch your journey in all the decision-making processes within the cellar. I, I remember even being at university uh, using one of your blogs that you wrote about ethanol cleaning. 
uh, of lines, yeah. which I just thought we we no, never got taught that in winemaking at university because mm. we had sulfur, and so it was almost like living without something challenged yeah. you to be cleaner than you have ever had. I noticed you use ozone in each of your like varying sort of ozone generators. I have never even yep. heard of that. What? Why? That is strange uh, because ozone, in, uh, you know, it, it is is being used in um, at various levels, and, uh, but more um, big industry because it cleans thoroughly without leaving traces, in, um, uh, and so it, it doesn't hurt your, um, um, your your it doesn't hurt you as as a person uh, because there's no chemicals in there. It is it kind of tricky uh, because of that, because it's a gas, uh, it dissolves, um, but it has an effect, but you can smell it. The good thing is you, 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 you clean a, a room with ozone and you smell it. it it's, a, it's a very peculiar um, um, uh, smell, uh, but it's very easy to detect. And, um, so, um, you know, getting, uh, it's, it's the process of um, getting better. How can you use something um, I like to use principles basically from the industrial world because they're way more advanced. They, they, they try to, they've got more access to all kinds of information. So, you know, when I go to visit the winery, I rarely go to a winery my size or smaller and, um, uh, or, or very, you know, very artisanal unless they're friends uh, because you don't learn anything basically. So, when I visit the winery, I will go to Antinori. How the hell can they manage that much, um, um, that many grapes in the, in such a good way? Like to make a Tignanello for crap shit, you know? And that is just unbelievable job, you know? Just process so many goddamn grapes, and you really make a, one hell of a good product out of that. Like Gaia, you know, from their classic Barbaresco, they make something like, I don't know, 200,000 bottles, which is more than our whole production together. Only one wine. It's like, Bloody hell, you know, that's where you learn. And so not mm. from what we do, but you learn from, from big industry, what you cannot do. And, but there, there are things that, that you can apply in what you do. The same thing in how you organize, how you organize a warehouse, how you organize processes in, um, uh, in your winery. And so you can, you can manage your time better, or you can say like, I don't want to do that, but I'll change that, twitch it into what I can use, such as ozone. And so we don't use it in the water because it corrodes too much. Um, because then, you know, in my figure out, you know, everybody's got cement floors. And, uh, and so they, they don't last because it eats away the, um, the, um, the armament in, um, uh, um, uh, of steel. It just really eats it away. Just unbelievable how the, um, how the stuff corrodes. And so we use it as a gas. To, um, uh, for the tanks, but all your nozzles, all the, um, the, the stainless steel has to be 316. You know, it can, cannot be 304 uh, because it corrodes. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's pretty damn corrosive. So it's highly effective. And especially, you know, it kills all the, um, uh, the, the yeast strains first, and then it hits the bacteria and also eventually viruses. So the first ones that get attacked are it's all the junk that is flying around in a, in a cellar, and basically. And so what we do in um, uh, today, well, since years already, um, uh, we put the ozone machines on before we get the first grapes in. So close all the, all the tanks, everything is sealed, and, um, uh, and then we, we leave them at the, the, the ozone machine on, on every floor we work. And we leave it on for, for a whole day, a day and a night, and the next um, morning, get in, put your masks, masks on, open all the, um, all the doors, shut off the machines and let the wind take everything out. Because, you know, you make a white room. And so when the grapes from that vintage come in, you know, then they get in without the influence and all the old stuff that's flying around in a cellar. So my cellar is basically a white room. And so when I have on my labels written 2021, those are the yeast strains from 2021. And not the old shit that's flying around in the, in the cellar, the, all the dirt and all the rest. So um, uh, when I put something on a label, and that's where the logics come back in. So, you know, sometimes I, I can go a bit too far, maybe, just because it goes a stretch. But again, you know, you need to have an, an, an intellectual concept. And so I said, like, it, everything started to yeast, like, okay, you, you buy a package of yeast and you put on a label 2021. You know, that's not 2021, you know. 
that is Monsanto or, or what the hell, who the hell made those yeasts. It's not your vintage anymore. There's very, very little bit of, of that in, them, in, in there. So the majority is something you added in there. So I, I, I will never use an, um, uh, selected yeast um, uh, from an industry. I use my own yeast with my nose here. Um, uh, that's why we make pied de cubes. But I have to make sure that even if I do that in a cellar where I've been working in, uh, in for 10 or 20 years, you cannot say those is, this is only 21 or 22 or 20. That's not the case because we know that yeast, they, they, they get into um, um, uh, all absorbing materials, even cement and in the walls, in tissue and everything. And so, you know, you, you have to clean it. And um, um, uh, whether people like it or not, you know, wine is, is made in a clean environment. Cheese is made with mold. Wine, definitely not. So that's very important. Well, talking about like going too, too far, you're, you're starting to, to branch out. Um, what's the relationship with Marco Tanessa? <laughs> uh, it's because I tried that wine. one, it's amazing. It's not his wine, you know. Uh, with Marco, we, we we drank and we tasted so many wines. You know, he 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 was a client of mine, a, a direct client. And then you know he's got the, this idea. We talked a lot about that. So Marco, just before um, I was I was doing this um, these wines for him, we um, um we we had a, a serious um, uh, we we had serious <laughs> tastings. <laughs> at home and at his place. So basically, you know, and um, it started as wine passionate, passionate persons. And I like that. And um, I like Marco. And, um, I, and uh, I love him. He's got something special. I always warned him, listen, you know, you're a banker. Um, uh, don't do something stupid like I did. Just cut with your, um, uh, with your old job and then you go and, and make some wine. It's very hard to succeed. So keep your job, do something. And I said like, I want to do something. Then, please, could you make the wines for me? And, um, uh, and then the whole thing um, started. And uh, so he picked during the day, came with the uh, with his van, and um, uh, then we, we, we made we made the wines and, um, for him. And, um, uh, and, and so you know, it it started uh, as a gimmick, actually, as a as a play, and um, and again based on the passion of wine not anything else and now he's got his own cellar and so it's 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 basically a very simple natural process and um helping out a, a person who and um, who, who was was basically on them um, had the same approach as um, as when i started and, uh, and so i saw a lot of things that then uh, that i've gone through and then uh, and so yeah it's uh, it's fun it's um, um it's great years and um, uh, I must say and um, uh, everything was intermingled with the um, uh, with wine passion and, and that's fantastic same thing for example with um, with a very good friend in uh, who also now makes wine is uh, la moresco la moresca uh, filippo rizzo well filippo um, used to be a client of mine in belgium when i was distributing wine he had an incredibly good restaurant for a sicilian cuisine and, um, uh, he and his and um, uh, my sister, and, um, uh, they they were in the, in the cook and um, they were cooking and they had absolutely simple, basic, really nice dishes. And I, I really like Filippo because he has um, he's not a, an easy guy, but maybe I'm not either. And so it, it clicked, so it it, it worked. And so he, he bought a um, land in, um, in Pacino and, um, and I went from here <laughs> with my team to, um, to farm that. I made his first, uh, I think the two or three vintages I, I made for him. And then he, he sold his restaurant in Belgium and moved to, uh, to San Michele di Ganzaria. Not in Pacino, he sold the, um, the, the vineyard eventually there because he couldn't manage it also, it was too difficult. So, you know, I'm, Besides being very logical, I'm also very intuitive and also very um, unrational because, you know, from a, from a business point of view, <laughs> you spend as much as you, and, um, uh, as you, and, uh, as you gain from, uh, from that, you know, but, you know, it's, it's experience, expertise you're gaining. And so that is something really interesting. For example, the uh, people say, ah, why don't you use barrels? Well, I said, I did use barrels and I have experience and I look like, what? Where, in which wine did you use the wood? Filippo's <laughs> wines. 
and I'm, uh, I use barrels. I know how to clean them. We did clean them, but I never use them on, uh, on my wines because I didn't like it. I don't, I think conceptually in my wines, I want the purity of fruit that transforms into wine. And when you taste the wine, you get back to the vineyard and not through a piece of wood, and, um, uh, which is a barrier and, um, uh, in taste. And so for me, that it just doesn't exist. Filippo's idea of wine is conceptually old style Sicilian winemaking, which was chestnut, and and uh, and, and so it, it perfectly fits in, in Filippo's intellectual um, uh, concept of wine. And so I so said, like, well, hell, you know, I'll, I'll make it for you, and um, I'll, I'll do it. And so we uh, we figured out how to find them uh, good barrels and this and that. So just to so give you, you an don't idea, use oak um, anymore, like at all, still. I never use it for my wines, and uh, I have the experience of using oak and uh, for um, uh, for Filippo's wines. So, you know, I'll, uh, I, I like that. It, when, even if I don't use some things, I'll, uh, I, I've used them for, um, for other people. Like, for example, I still make the, the wine for, um, um, for my, my best man and, um, who has a restaurant here in the village, Cave Ops. Sandra's the best man of, our, um, uh, of, my, uh, of my marriage with Aki. And you know, I make his house wine, but I make it differently. So I'm um, what I like my own wines that's made with my head, you know. And also, I love my, when that, that's a very important issue, you know. A winery with two people in the cellar, cellars. That means two mindsets, two brains on one wine. That's always a guarantee for a fuck up. Sooner or later, <laughs> it's going to go wrong. It's. <laughs> A wine needs one head, one vision, one decision, mm. and not two mm. or three. It's the same as having like two or three um, um, doctors on on your body when when you have an, um, an, a health issue. That's going to be disaster. And it doesn't work. You have to believe and stick to something. Well, something so, that wasn't disastrous, though, was this Mungebel Bianco. I could have sworn black and blue that you used oak on that. But is that the Gracanico that's this honey? <laughs> it felt Burgundian. It was incredible. No. That is one thing, but the, the oak part is because of the macerations. Because you know, uh, I used uh, still a part of the stems, you know, we, um, uh, because my Viras um, uh, my D stemmer, um, was not uh, was not really absolutely super top notch, you know. That was kind of rustic, and so we picked out well not by hand, but some of the and the bits and, uh, and pieces stayed in there, and so um, uh, it was high alcohol, high extraction, six months, and so. What you extract from a little tiny bits and, and pieces of, of stems, plus and that's that's the most dominant factor, the seeds. The seeds, you know, when you do five or six months of extraction, you um, with with fourteen um, plus alcohol wines, then you extract a lot from the essential oils, and you have this sense of oak in the wine. But it comes from the ripe seeds, so. Never used any oak. I never used oak on my wines. Wow. So I, I was interested when Filippo told me his concept of wine. I said, like, well, shit, you know, I'll make the wine for you and I'll use the barrels I'll, um, uh, on your wine. And so, you know, it, it gave me experience again, you know. But it, that is important. You know, you know, don't stubbornly say no to something. Maybe do it for somebody else, but at least, you know, get some experience. Well, I, I hear a rumor you might be getting some experience in making wine in Japan. Is this true? Well, yes, it's true. Uh, <laughs> but also here, you know, this, this one started very differently. Uh, um, first of all, I'm not sure we, we will be able to plant and, uh, because it's a very long uh, process. And uh, Japan is, is uh, it's not the easiest country. <laughs> like, like Italy, maybe. I don't know. I've chosen the other one. <laughs> Um, it, it's very bureaucratic, and so everything is, uh, is a very slow process. Before you can do something, you have to. It, it's you know, it, I could go go on like here for uh, for a few hours. Basically, you know, everything started with me wanting to have a hut in the mountains to go skiing. Fair. And then, you know, there's the, um, uh, that's the nice part. And so like, okay, Hokkaido, my wife is Japanese, the kids stay there, they might um, go and study there. And so I so said, like, well, you know, this kind of fits together. And um, so, you know, I said, like, well, you know, why not planting a vineyard there? 
Uh, and so before buying something, then we said like, well, okay, it's maybe it's possible, maybe not. And so the, the whole process started, you know, my, um, uh, thank God my wife is Japanese, but um, um, otherwise, you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't even been, you know, possible to, to buy something there. And so uh, everything is quite complex with one big, big, big advantage. I'm not pressed for time. And so if I can plant it and I get the authorizations, I'll do it in my life. If not, you know, the kids will do it and they will have fun with the, uh, with the ones. So, you know, um, it's a project where I do not want to put pressure on the lid on top of what we have here. So we have already enough, and, um, uh, you know, we've got enough meat on the grill and so we don't want, uh, want it to burn. Um, so, you know, Japan is a project which has to be nice. It has to be a technical challenge for me. And so we'll, um, uh, when, when I have the first one, we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll do another chat and, um, uh, and then we can, um, uh, we can talk about that. But there, you know, I have my, my head very clear on what to do there, and, uh, but it's going to be very technical. And, uh, like, like what? Can you share any details or is it all a secret? It, it starts with the, with the selection of the vines because we're, um, um, we're hitting you know, the limits of viticulture physically in, um, um, in, in terms of, um, uh, of climate. Uh, you know, the, the geology is there, the exposure we, we have also, uh, uh, we need to find, I want to find there what I cannot do here, basically. Here, for example, on Etna, um, whether you like it or not, people think like this is a beautifully natural place. Well, it's a me, which means yes and no. Um, uh, it is true, but it is, uh, an, um, uh, it's, it's a European place natural place which means when i go to norway and you know you you see incredible land and the, the same in australia you know it, it or new zealand it, it just hasn't got anything to do with it it is very european a lot of villages the presence of man is very 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 here in hokkaido you have that sense of nature where you know if you get lost there you're pretty fucked up and then uh, you know then that's, that's gonna be that's serious we've got bears there and then uh, we've got deer it's just wow man you know what a place so just that is is, uh, is already a challenge and then the climate you know we are literally at the edge of of, um, of freezing the, the vines to death um, so you have to have totally different techniques you can use the snow to pile them up to protect them so you know, you get into a challenge where I say like, uh, okay, this feels good. You know, it's like going back 25 years in time, do something new again. Like uh, have this, this punch, like you don't know, you have an idea, but you, you have to work through everything. And I'm sure I can make shortcuts with the experience I have now. So instead of having to uh, to spend another 25 years there, I think in, uh, in 10 years, I can, um, I can crank something out there. So it's going to be fun. So Hokkaido Riesling from Frank Ken Ellison. Ah, ha, ha. Well, Riesling, not really. Uh, it could be, uh, but it doesn't have the warmth. You know, Riesling mm. likes quite a warmth and, um, and sun. You don't have that in Hokkaido. So um, I can say that already. It do, it, it'll definitely not be a Riesling. It, you don't get there with a the Riesling. It will be super acid, maybe to be nice to make a sparkling, but... I like wines that have a, a, a maturation. They, they have to have a richness mm. with elegance. Like for me, the, um, if we're talking, for example, white wines, and um, uh, for me, great white wines are, um, uh, are Alsace wines. Uh, not Burgundy. I, I know they're great. Everybody knows that they're smooth, they're round, they're, they're sexy and whatever else, you know. But for me, the, the really um, great whites, you know, they are the, um, uh, they're the Alsace wines. Uh, fantastic. Cool. And um, a beautiful toque from, uh, from super locations. That's, that's great. So, you know, I, I need that richness. Uh, and that is difficult to, uh, to, to produce there. So that's why I'm saying it's one hell of a challenge um, to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to go make wine there. But, you know, it's nice because, you know, I, what I don't like are holidays. You know, I'm totally, I, I, I profoundly hate holidays because it's like a total waste of time. 
you know, you sit there, you, it's nice, like a beach is, is the, the worst of the worst, you know. Um, uh, if you have a computer, then you know, your wife, she, she screams, and she's like, wow, well, you got your computer, you're working, we could do this and that. I don't really like that. It's just like, um, um, uh, let me do some sports. And I like and I'm going biking, mountain biking, skiing, mountain skiing, whatever else. Uh, I love telemark skiing because I, I did this for, uh, for so many years. And, you know, when you spend money on your holiday, it's costs. You might as well make wine, you know. You'll have some kind of revenue. And um, it's going to take you a lot, I know, years before it's, it's going to come back. But at least you have fun. And you got some revenue in them in due time for um, for the next generation. So you know, we'll see. It's not too bad. Not a bad way to spend your time. I think so. <laughs> well, I'm acutely aware of your time. You've got to get to get to work. I've got one last question. You're 63. How are the energy <laughs> levels? Am are I still going? Are you? Yeah, my my well, my wife. She she says I'm uh, I'm nine years old. I know. <laughs> Mate. Our, our son is, um, is, is 13, and so, you know, it, it's fine. So we're, we're, in the, we're making a great team, you know, and uh, we're, we're the, uh, the kids in the, in the house probably. No, it's, it's what you uh, – I think age is um, – there is obviously a physical um, aspect. So uh, if I think back, like when I started at 40 years of age, you, you – like having your first wines hitting the market and talking like when you're 45, you know, or, or making serious decisions at 45, 46. It's um, it's not, uh, it's actually a, a, a young age if you think about it because, you know, you have to cut away 20 years. The first 20 is a lifespan. You you, you grow mentally, physically, and, um, and then, you know, from 20, you can start thinking. But basically 25, you go and work. So, Basically, what I've done is um, uh, from 25 to 45, let's say, it's only 20 years. From 45 to, to, to 65, that's also 20 years. I still believe them. Um, I believe that when, um, when uh, physically and work-wise, and, uh, 45 is a great age. Also to have kids, like the, um, uh, our kids, they, uh, they were born when I was 40, uh, yeah, 40 and I'm 40 or 45 years old, 46. So, uh, you know, that that's... It sounds um, uh, quite old, but it also keeps you young. And uh, I think there there's differences. Obviously, you know, when um, uh, I will pass away, when uh, when they will be will be relatively young, but still, you know, uh, I think it it is um, it's a choice in life. And um, um, honestly, so um, uh, back to age, I think it's much more of a mental thing than a physical thing. You know, I, I like sports. I, I do it. I don't do the workouts every day anymore. But, um, uh, you know, I, I like going biking. And uh, there, there are, uh, there, there's really nice things in them in life. And also, it is relatively physical. And uh, when I go out and uh, work in the, in the land, you know, it, it, it makes you feel good. So I don't really feel that old. But, you know, it's different. When, um, when I started making wine, you know, that was energy all over the place. Now it's much more focused and, uh, but I also have other people around me and so that compensates and I don't make the stupid mistakes anymore which I did in the, uh, in the first time so taking that into account I think I can um, I've got another 10 years to uh, to go and then you have to start making um, paying attention like uh, from 75 to to 80 and then getting into 85 you know obviously you're not going going to run around and I'm uh, like crazy and um, you need to have like a backup and assistance and, uh, next to you and also you know your mind doesn't work that fast anymore uh, inevitably and then uh, you're slower in your reactions in your thinking and everything so it, it's an inevitable um, process and, uh, so but which is also nice you know the real value of life let's never forget that is you know is only because of the existence of death otherwise life doesn't have any value it's death Very that fair. defines life and that's why you know great wines are like barolo or like etna you know uh, everybody's talk about the devastating fierce um, uh, power of etna it's true but let's not forget you know the the ultimate form of life is death and just like every good interview, it also needs to end. <laughs> Frank? There you go. Thank we'll you We'll see very each other much. in eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to hear all about 
It's all about this this Japanese potentially ferment now. There you go. I'll keep you updated. <laughs> Mate, have a wonderful right. rest of your day, and hopefully they don't stick the tiles upside down for their sake. <laughs> Ciao.